I'm Mark Gale. Welcome to Taking Stock, filmed on location at iCreate Studios. We're bringing you all the latest business news and telling you how it'll affect you and your portfolio. Come on, let's get this money. First up, Jamaica stands to lose billions as tourists shun travel amid the COVID-19 global outbreak. We get an update from Tourism Minister Ed Bartlett, fresh from his Florida meeting with Carnival Cruise Line. And Mayor of St. Anne's Bay, Michael Belnavis, tells us about the impact of last week's cancelled cruise visits, while Vice President of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association and General Manager of Rainforest Seafoods, Jerome Mai, explains the impact of the virus on local manufacturing. And later, the Jamaica Stock Exchange recorded its biggest decline in its 60-year existence. The prospectus for Proven's additional public offer is now out. And how did First Rock Capital Holdings do as a newly listed company? The analysts weigh in. But first, here's What's Hot, brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. A historic low. The Jamaica Stock Exchange experienced its largest one-day decline in the history of the exchange. The combined market on Thursday lost 21,152 points, or almost 5%. This followed another massive decline on Tuesday of over 12,600 points. The Ministry of Tourism has slashed projected earnings from the sector by $76 billion due to the impact of COVID-19. Anticipated revenue has been reduced to 502 billion Jamaican dollars or about 3.7 billion US. Projected arrivals have also been reduced. They're now expecting 4.3 million visitors. That's 300,000 less than the initial projections. This puts in jeopardy the ministry's goal of generating 5 billion U.S. dollars in earnings and welcoming 5 million visitors by 2021. The police have listed the owners of Symbiote Limited, which operates as telecoms provider Carousel, as persons of interest. CEO Lowell Lawrence and his wife, company secretary Minette Lawrence, along with four other persons linked to the company and its affiliate Extranet Limited, were also listed as persons of interest. This comes after a raid of the company's premises on February 21. Carousel was ordered to stop operations in 2019 after a court of appeal ruling, but it's alleged the company continued providing service. Proven Investments additional public offer, APO, opens Wednesday, March 11. The company is selling more than 178 million new ordinary shares with an option to upsize by 50%. Share price is $38.64 Jamaican or $0.28 cents U.S. The company is looking to raise 50 million U.S. dollars, which will be used to fund upcoming acquisitions. Watch the latest episode of Money Monday's JA for more details. Over in Guyana, tension has been high due to allegations of fraud in the March 2 general elections. Concerns have been raised about the results for Region 4, the most populated election district. This has prompted protests by the opposition People's Progressive Party, PPP, which is demanding that the Guyana Election Commission, GCOM, release the official results. The U.S., British, Canada and Europe have also shared concerns about the affairs in the newly oil-rich Caribbean state. What's Hot was brought to you by Jamaica Money Market Brokers, your best interest at heart. When we come back, the outbreak of COVID-19, which originated in Wuhan, China, has significantly disrupted global supply chains. Businesses locally and internationally have struggled to stay afloat. We'll hear from the Vice President of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association and General Manager of Rainforest Seafoods, Jerome Miles, and the Mayor of St. Anne's Bay, Michael Belnavis. Kalila will also give us an update from Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett about his meeting with the cruise industry. Taking Stock is filmed on location at iCreate Studio on Hope Road. There's a surplus of unfilled jobs in the creative industry. Kickstart a creative career with iCreate Institute. Now I'm at iCreate, I just love it. I saw where I was learning things that I could utilize in my present job. And I have all the skills to do every basic animation thing now. Jumpstart a creative career with iCreate Institute at UCC. Visit iCreateEDU.com. This 
segment of Taking Stock is brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agent. Insurance made easy. Welcome back to Taking Stock. Before we jump into our discussion, I just want to thank our sponsor, Water, for their wonderful products. Now, there have been growing concerns in the business community about uh, the novel coronavirus, COVID-19. In fact, last week, three Carnival cruise ships were turned back from Jamaica and Dominican Republic and eventually they were able to successfully dock in St. Martin. Now, that has led to major fallout or tensions between the Jamaican health authorities and the cruise lines, the Caribbean cruise lines. As a result, tourist destinations in Jamaica have been impacted by the negative fallout in revenue. Um, cities like Ocho Rios and Montego Bay. Tourism Minister Edmund Bartlett spoke with Taking Stock via video link over the weekend. He was fresh from a meeting with cruise executives from Carnival and MSC in Florida on Friday following cancelled calls to Ocho Rios last week. There have reportedly been disagreements over Jamaica's strict protocols for cruise visitors with flu-like symptoms and questionable travel history. The country has turned back one ship and refused to allow Italians on board another from setting foot on the island. But according to Minister Bartlett, the good news is that they're now seeing eye to eye and full resumption of cruise visits is expected shortly. The meetings were great meetings. Um, we have seen eye to eye in almost every step and we are expecting to see um, full resumption, you know, uh, in the best way it's possible under the circumstances uh, within the next few weeks. But that doesn't mean Jamaica is abandoning its position. Minister Bartlett says he and Health Minister Dr. Christopher Tufton are on the same page, although there have been reports of differences. There was a little misunderstanding in the world, not among us, because the minister and I have seen essentially eye to eye in terms of the protocol. Jamaica is at one in terms of the protocol. Where we had difficulty was with our partners, you know, who had difficulty with elements of the protocol. He says one of the issues the cruise lines was having was that the protocols were too time consuming. By the time they finally get through, it's almost time for the ship to leave. Mr. Bartlett says he will be issuing a joint statement with the cruise lines shortly and can't say more at this time. What is the protocol? Oh, well, but, but, but Kalila, you are brilliant and you're slowly getting me to say what I told you we can't say yet. <laughs> <laughs> because we have a joint agreement. According to Minister Bartlett, Jamaica is estimated to lose some $76 billion this year in what he calls opportunity loss due to travel restrictions and fears over COVID-19. He says that number may even need to be revised further. A telling sign was his trip back to Jamaica on Saturday morning. But the tragedy for the experience and the tragedy for the event was that the flight was empty. When I oh. say empty, it's the first I've ever come on a plane that was so empty. It probably signs of the time. Uh, uh, you know, I, I called, as the media as a came I called the chairman when it first worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for a discussion on it because um, I want a situation analysis this weekend as to exactly where we are, what's happening with the um, the, the early break. Um how many flights have come in since the issues um, of of the numbers that we expected. What are the volumes? A dire sign for Jamaica, which has relied heavily on tourism to bolster its weak economic growth. Those numbers already struggling last quarter, following the closure of the Gisco Alpart plant and the decline of the important bauxite industry. Joining us today are the Vice President of the Jamaica Manufacturers and Exporters Association and also General Manager of Rainforest Seafoods, Jerome Miles, and Mayor of St. Anne's Bay, Michael bell -Navis. Thank you, gentlemen. So let me start with, with Jerome. What are some of the concerns that your members have expressed to you at the JMEA? Currently, the major concern that all our constituents have is the potential impact on their employees. Okay. There are also considering impacts on their supply chain, getting goods in to, to produce, 
and also in a smaller way some exports. Exports will be less affected initially, but on both the export and the people front and the imports, there we are expecting. Um, That's interesting. So, so the, the the main concern is there is the safety and the health of their, of their own employees. Correct. So I guess the, the question there is just you know like what are they doing? What you know measures are they putting in place to you know either? I mean I know it's still early. We don't have any reported cases, but you know what are both what's the association doing um, to kind of help them think through how to approach it and what are some of the things that you're hearing from some of your members in terms of what they're doing very good question all our empl all our constituents are in the planning phase okay and they are putting in their disaster preparedness plans which means things like stocking up on critical items looking at their supply chain where they get goods from making sure that they have all of the items they need to help protect their employees, you know, um, sanitizers, proper right. soaps, cleaning agents, protocols to manage contact with the general public. And they're also looking at things like, you know, remote working. Yeah. And what would happen if 50% of your employees didn't turn up? Right. Now we're in manufacturing and therefore there's a lot of labor involved. And Nothing happens without our people, so we have to be very mindful of how we, you know, plan that to manage a potential impact. That's actually something I was gonna, gonna kind of like drill in a little bit. Is we've been seeing there's a lot of, of discussion in global media, particularly in the U.S. and I guess in Europe, you know, about companies implementing remote remote work policies. Um, and I guess it's it's easier when you're in the knowledge economy, you know, to have. 10,000 or 20,000 employees or stay at home and you know logging on your computer. I, I would imagine it's a lot more challenging when you run a factory, you know, that does require, as you said, you know, a lot of labor. So realistically, how much can the local manufacturers, you know, some of your members really adjust and implement remote work policies to actually um, kind of like staunch the brunt of the impact? Or is that like, in other words, what I'm asking is, you know, it, let's say, you know, 10% of their workforce, you know, realistic, realistically can use remote work, but the other 90% has to physically be there. Is remote work an actual, you know, sustainable solution? Actually, in manufacturing, it's going to be a challenge. Um, in the company in which I work, probably 70% of the, it wouldn't apply to 70% of the workforce. So really to prepare properly, what you have to do is know when you have everybody, you try and ramp up to make mm -hmm. sure that you have adequate stocks of preparation for a time when you don't have as many people. Right. Uh, remote working really is mainly for your admin, your management, right. staff, and therefore a big impact on the labor force will be a big impact on manufacturing. Yeah. As we have seen with what has happened in China, you know, a lot of factories are down because the labor is being, you know, stopped from going to work. All right, so I mean, I'm gonna come back to you in a second, but Michael, so as the, the, the mayor of St. Anne's Bay, so St. Anne is a tourist mecca, as it were. You know, what are you hearing from business owners, you know, about, you know, what's happening? I would imagine there's, you know, some, some amount of concern, but you know, express you know, what you're seeing or what you're hearing from them. Well, um, on the ground, the average man on the ground is, um, is actually happy that there is no coronavirus in, in Jamaica at this time. Fact is that the reason why there isn't any is because the government has taken a, a kind of um, no-nonsense approach to, to mitigating against um, such a, it's a, it's an inborn virus. Right. In other words, a virus that comes into that is coming into Jamaica is not homegrown. Right. So um, at the port of, of entry and the airports, we have instituted a, a, a kind of screen. So people are coming off of the ships are are the manifesto is is, is uh, re requested. Uh, if there are anyone that have gone to the infirmaries on the ship, if, uh, we ask that information, and then uh, we check their temperatures. If they are from a country of of, um, that has had the virus like Italy, China, some of those places, then those, those individuals are tested. We ask for this information before the ship comes in. Uh, the reason why two ships were held last week and they were delayed was that this information did not, was not forthcoming uh, in a timely manner. So it, the ship had to be delayed until that information was gotten. 
the all care was given by the local board of health, the health department and the ministry of health. Thereafter, we had several ships come in um, into the port of Waterhouse since then, and they, were, they all gave information in. Some actually gave it, gave it in overnight because the protocols were established. And, um, and they've all started to observe the protocols. And uh, so we, have had, we haven't had any situations coming off of the cruise ships because of that. Um, and at the airport, you know, they've been testing and so on. So um, I think that we've done a good job so far. The numbers speak for themselves. We don't have any, any situations here. However, if, there, if for some reason it comes in, um, but people are saying it's not if, it's, just, it's when. Right. Um, we, we, we have put all measures in place. At the St. Anne's Bay Regional Hospital, we, the, the staff has been trained to deal with the situation. How do they you know, gear up themselves with the plastic gloves, the masks, um, the sterilizations. Uh, we have two sets of rooms available right now. One's for if you're quarantined, uh, where you know, if you're in, in a suspected situation, and then there's another set that if you're, if you're um, with it, then you can, you can actually go into isolation. So um, we have those rooms in place. Um, but not in a, in a great way. In other words, we can only hold about 30 some individuals. Right. Uh, if it becomes a pandemic situation, then obviously the whole paradigm changes and we'd have to look at uh, um, maybe a mass uh, situation, maybe on the tents, right. things of that nature, uh, because we don't have the, that type of facility to house hundreds of people, which could even be thousands, right. um, in, a mass, in a sort of pandemic situation. We'd have to get help and assistance from other in countries, other areas, um, and so on. But we put things in place to deal with it um, in stages. And um, I don't believe that, uh, based on what we're doing right now, um, we are, we've taken the small steps, we've ironed out the kinks, and I think we're ready to deal with any sort of situation. And it's funny enough, you know, because as the local board of health and as the municipal corporation, you know, the mayor and the customs in a disaster situation takes charge of the parish. All right. When you think of disaster, you think of maybe a hurricane, you know, we're used to that, earthquakes, things like that. We kind of used to those. Right. And um, every year, almost, we have a hurricane situation. And, you know, we have to have the NWA ready to clear the blockages. We have the fire department. We have um, you know, tr tr tractor men there and pious to move and clear the roads and um, that type of thing. So we used to that type of thing. Right. Uh, putting the shelters in place, things like that. So the utilization of some of that experience would be would translate into the, a pandemic of, of a coronavirus. Um, the schools and churches and, ho and, and hostels and um, church halls and so on would be used as shelters and we use as isolation um, rooms facilities. and so on, facilities. So those are things that, um, and we've identified all those, all those already through our um, disaster preparedness department. All right, so so you know, we're, we're, we're ready. Okay, that sounds good, but, but kind of going back to the business owner specifically, right? So what is, I guess what I'm just trying to figure out is, you know, how are they doing? So like a lot of the, I was reading an article recently mm -hmm. um, where Grace was talking about, Don Webby had mentioned that, you know, they have two months worth of um, so inventory, basically, right, right? To, to last any um, supply chain disruptions. Right. Um, a lot of the business owners, or the businesses in St. Anne, I imagine, are you know obviously smaller than a grace, right? So, how are they thinking through how to manage you know this process, and have they communicated you know to you you know disruptions in the supply chain that they are experiencing? And I don't think too many people are thinking about it in terms of doing additional stock ups. I know my wife has bought some stuff and put you know, and have, uh, so several grocery bags of tin items and so on, just put down so in case it's like a hurricane situation. Right. Um, but uh, I don't think too many people are thinking about that. There's an economic um, situation for most people, really, you know, most people can only you know, buy the stuff that they need every week, so right. there's, there's that hindrance. But uh, beyond that scope, uh, I don't think m many people are, because we don't have it here as yet, it's, um, and it seems kind of you know, remote, right. it's kind of like a, 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 you know, a, an ocean away, right. um, then there, you know, they have so not many people have moved in that direction. But the smaller the business, the more concerned they are, um, and they are kind of happy that we've taken the decisions that we've taken to really keep the cruise ships, um, at, you know, in, under some level of control, and um, and to watch the airports. Uh, the, the smaller business people, the, uh, the craft vendors, the little man on the road, they're happy. But what I found is that the bigger businesses. I uh, was saying, well, when you turn back the ship, 
you know? mm -hmm. um, and they're more concerned with the bottom yeah, line and the, the dollars associated yeah, from so, the ships. So that, that's, that's actually a tension that we've been seeing, right? Yeah. It is, I guess the question is, so, so those cruise lines, when they get turned back, yeah. right? So I would imagine that all those vendors that normally sell to the, the tourist passengers, right. they lose out on all of those But sales. everybody loses. Right. They lose those situations. I'd just like to jump in here right, sure, a, sure. a quick point on the, for manufacturers in particular, I think this whole scenario presents a wake-up call to the, the country as to why we need local manufacturing. You know? mm. but time and again, you'll hear people saying, well, oh, Jamaica, we can't make anything, we can't do this and we can't do that. Particularly in agro-processing, food security is a big deal. Right. And to be able to supply more and more of what you need to sustain your country in terms of food locally, mm -hmm has to be a good thing and this kind of scenario kind of says yeah you know really but Jerome, need to rethink the, the other so just to play contrary a little, a little bit right so that the economist in me or the the economists will argue jamaica should really kind of focus on where we have comparative advantage so like we shouldn't for example produce um you know i'm not saying that we don't have a comparative advantage in this crop i'm just using this as, a, as an example you know we shouldn't produce onion we should it's better for us to import onion and focus on coffee or focus on sorrel or something else that you know we can um capture a lot more of the value from as opposed to trying to do you know onion and lettuce and you know Everything. every single thing that we eat right because at the end of the day i agree i understand what you're saying in the sense that manufacturers benefit and I guess the economy is more healthy because every dollar that is spent with a local manufacturer um, travels throughout the economy more. Um, but the question is, will the consumers benefit? Because if it's more expensive for me to buy a bag of onions, you know, from a, a local farmer as opposed to an imported, you know, bag of onions, am I better off as a the consumer, you know, paying an additional for argument's sake, two hundred dollars per pound. It's not an all or nothing thing, right. and I mean, there is no. I would not sit here and tell you we must produce everything you eat. Fair enough. Events like this shows you how important having more and more of your, particularly your food, produced locally. Mm -hmm. If you could think back to when they had the mad cow disease scare, the swine flu scare, H one N one, what they called bird flu, and a lot of the protein dried up, access to protein globally dried up. If all of those things were to happen, you know, you can see how important it is to have, particularly your, your, your food, food manufacturing right. in being done in Jamaica. Right. Now there's a point about we can't do everything and we can't do so many things economically, but the spin-offs from having a product produced here is a lot more than just the price that you pay for it. Right. So in other words, because I was actually just about to say that, so I understand you know, your perspective as a manufacturer, but just from the, the economic standpoint, you know, generally speaking, we want Jamaican companies to focus on things that we can add the most value to, right? That it's easier to compete on a world stage with things that, I mean, obviously ganja, for example, you know, um, coffee, um, sorrel, products that are, I guess, more aki, you know, endemic to Jamaica, that Jamaica is known for, that, you know, we can extract a lot of value from. But I understand, you know, the point that you're making in terms of the, you know, I guess the pass-through effect of every dollar that um, a local manufacturer earns versus, you know, somebody that's just importing the goods. So that's the argument that you're making, right? That's Correct. Well, so one of the things that I wanted to kind of, um, you know, ask you is, so now when I'm thinking about the JMEA, right? So I run an SME, you know, we do, um, we do import some raw material and then we do, you know, so much light manufacturing in Jamaica and know that, you know, the coronavirus is kind of in the headlines and is disrupting, you know, major supply chains. Thankfully, you know what, we are not completely adversely affected right now, but I could see how, you know, me being a small business can get lost in the shuffle of everything. And so I can see the value of being a part of the JMEA. So what I would want to know from you is, so imagine, you know, I have, I'm in a situation where one of my suppliers, you know, their factory is shut down and I can't easily find a replacement. If I was a member of the JMEA, would you guys help me, you know, figure that out? Or do you offer services like that to members? And well, we have a, a fairly strong secretariat that's housed on Duke Street. That's the place where all manufacturers can go to make contacts, develop the networks, get information. And we have people in the secretariat who are dedicated to providing this kind of information. Right. 
So it is really advantageous to, at these times like this, to be a member of the, the JMEA. Okay, all right. And then just out of curiosity, uh, you may not be able to speak to this for every single member, but on average, how much inventory in weeks or months does the average member store? I mean, because if the supply chain is disrupted, right, and it, the disruption will last like three months, you know, how prepared would they be for the amount of inventory that they have? Each manufacturer is gonna look at their demand a piece of information that I got from the Ministry of Health in the interactions that we've had with them. They're saying if the virus comes to Jamaica, the peak will be eight weeks from that date. Okay. So you're probably looking at needing to hold eight weeks of inventory. Most manufacturers will hold eight weeks. You want to hold as little as possible. Right. But particularly if you are a manufacturer and distributor. Right. If you're a manufacturer, you want to sell the product as soon as you make it. If you're a distributor, you hold inventory for shocks in the, just for things like this. If you're an exporter, it's particularly if you're exporting to the smaller Caribbean islands, they may start to pull in stock inventory because of the same issue. Right. So you may find that you get bigger orders now, and therefore it causes a domino effect in your business. So we're looking at six to eight weeks okay. on a minimum. Okay. To be held. All right. And real quick, Mr. Mayor. So basically, even though you know we're seeing a tension bet between you know health and tourism, what you're saying is, or what you're seeing is, the vendors you know that um, in Saint Anne in particular are not overly perturbed by you know losing the, the cruise ship business. Some vendors have told me that they are scared, and the fear is out there. And the fear is, is that the control, how they think and so on, and people are more concerned at this juncture with the, because of the unknown, you know, what is it that is happening? And the fear is and about the virus the or virus the loss itself. of business? No, the virus okay. is almost like they're forgetting about the business aspect okay. until they realize, gosh, you know, we're losing business. Uh, the fear is overriding the business. So much so that um, the, the, the joke on the road now is that the boy, the tourists love having harassment. No, right. you, know? <laughs> you know, but um, the fact is that uh, they're there, they're concerned, and um, you know, we're trying to tell them that one of the biggest things that you can have you now is to have fear, because fear in itself it can be overriding. And um, you know, so let us just go along, business as usual, let, let the government take care of it and everything will be, will be fine. Um, you know, it's a fine line, because when, you, when the ships come in, you want them to come off, right. the tourists to come off. You want thousands of tourists to come off. You want them to interact with the craft vendors. You want them to interact with the, the boutiques, the cafes, the bars, you know, the inbound merchants. You want people to spend money. Right. Um, and we're seeing the best um, in Ultras. And you know, at the same time, Ultras Pier is one of the best top 10 piers in the world right now. Okay. It's highly ranked. So there's a, there, everybody wants to come to Ultras. Everybody wants to come to Dungeon Falls. Right? So it's, it's highly, highly uh, sought after. Mm -hmm. So when these thousands of tourists come off the ships, we want them to inter, intermingle and interact with the, with the, with the folks. Um, and we don't want people to you know, feel that there's a, there's a threat out there. So we have to do what is necessary to take care of that, 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 that threat. But at the same time, um, those business folks who have the bigger entities and so on, must recognize that we have to do what is necessary to protect the population. Because the ironic thing is that if you're scared now, can you imagine how things would be if right. you had actually had the, the right. virus here? It would be almost, right. you know? Um, okay. So we have, to, we have to deal with it, and it's a fine, a fine line, and, and we're managing that fine line right now. Okay. Thanks, gentlemen. Thank you very much. When we come back, I've got your market recap, and the analysts are standing by. This segment of Taking Stock was brought to you by Bulwark Insurance Agency. Insurance made easy. Time now for your market recap, brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. The Jamaica Stock Exchange had its worst week ever. The combined index declined by more than 50,000 points or 10%. 93 stocks traded across both the main and junior markets of the JSC for the week ending Friday, March 6, 2020. Only 13 advanced, while 75 declined, and 5 traded firm. 198 million shares changed hands on the Jamaican dollar market, totaling over $1 billion. 
Select F traded the most, taking up 50% of market volume. People bought and sold 99 million shares in the company. However, the stock lost four cents to start this week at a dollar. Wigton Wind Farm traded the second most, taking up 18% of market volume. The stock lost 12 cents, with people buying and selling 36 million shares in the company. Wigton closed last week at 72 cents. And Select MD also traded heavily, with people buying and selling 11 million shares in the company, but it was unaffected by the market slump. The stock remained unchanged to open this week at 92 cents. Turning to the top advancers now, JMMB Group 7.5% saw the biggest gain, up 25% to start this week at 75 cents. CAC 2000 9.5% cumulative redeemable preference shares gained an impressive 24% to open the week at 99 cents. And sterling investments rose by nearly 14%. Sterling starts this week at $3.31. On the losing side now, and there were many double-digit losses, led by Caribbean flavors and fragrances down nearly 31% to open this week at $10.15. Cygnus Credit Investments' JMD Ordinary Shares also took a big hit, down 27% to open the week at $18.68. And Sterling Investments' US Dollar Shares lost $0.01 cent to open on Monday at $0.02 cents US. Market Recap was brought to you by Sagicor Investments. Think wealth, think Sagicor Investments. This segment of Taking Stock, The Analysts, is brought to you by Proven Wealth, Jamaica Money Market Brokers, and Ideal Portfolio Services. Welcome back to Taking Stock. I have a team of analysts with me. First, we have um, to my left, Investment Analyst at Proven Wealth, Julian Morrison. And also we have Senior Wealth Advisor at Ideal Portfolio Services, Auric Angus. And then we also have Equity Trader at Jamaica Money Market Brokers, Clive Charlton. Thank you. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Last week was a particularly interesting week. The JSC, the combined index, lost about $207 billion of, of value. Um, you know, we've seen market softness over the last couple of weeks, but last week just felt particularly pernicious. So I'd love to kind of like unpack that because we've had over the last you know, couple of years in particular, especially the last 2019, the first three quarters of 2019 was, it was great, right? Everybody was jumping in, you know, we had everything, it felt like everything was going up, right? Oh, and then yeah. now over the last couple of months, we've had a pullback and in the last week in particular, it, it has been a pretty aggressive pullback. So, can we, um, you know, kind of like dive into that a little bit and, you know, talk about what's happening, what caused it, and what can we learn? So, Julian? In my mind, there are a few factors that would have caused this kind of activity on the market. Now, we had three events that coincidentally aligned. We had the spread of the news around the coronavirus, particularly in the United States. And this would be an area where a lot of Jamaicans would have relatives and so on. So it's a place close to home for many, so to speak, psychologically. The second thing is the market was already pulling back from the Trans, Trans Jamaica transaction. Then the third factor would have been the US reacting to the coronavirus news. So when a lot of retail investors hearing about this virus, seeing the US market pulling back in relation to that virus, and seeing the softening that would have been happening from the Trans-Jamaica um, offer, which would have happened recently, the alignment of those three events would have convinced many to think that it would have had a direct impact on our market. Mm -hmm. So it could be as a result of panic selling based on those three things aligned. Okay, and so just to kind of unpack it a little bit, when you said the market pulled back because of the Trans-Jamaica IPA, what you're referring to is the fact that because the IPO was coming, it was so large, right. many investors, they decided to sell some of their stocks in their portfolio to free up cash so they can participate in the IPO. Definitely, and because it's such a large offer, it's right. an elephant pretty much, right. metaphorically speaking. It's 11 billion, right? right. Mm -hmm. And it closed relatively quickly. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's to right, yeah. show you the level of rebalancing that would have been taking place. Right. Okay. Uh, Arik, thoughts? 
Yeah, I agree with Julian. It's a combination of factors um, that's leading to what I say one of our worst week on the stock exchange um, in its 60 years history. One, the coronavirus, as he had stated before, um, with Trans Jamaica coming in at around to raise at about $14 billion. And then you have proven coming in right behind that as, as soon as it closed. It says a lot. Um, a lot of people are rebalancing their portfolio or taking profits to get into these new listings. And as such, is, it has caused a big drag down in the market um, in support of um, the virus I mentioned earlier. There's a looming recession that is on the radar. Right. And then there are other small issues or listings that are coming up that people are anticipating as well that should possibly um, impact um, the stock market in terms of them holding cash to take take on these opportunities as they surface. So I think all of that in a nutshell is the reason why um, the, the JSC has been pulling back. Okay. And Clive, what, what impact do you think that margin, you know, or debt in equity markets, um, particularly over the last year, could have in what we're in the in the pullback that we're seeing now. We know people have been borrowing. You know, we're seeing a few ads. We're not. It's difficult to quantify that amount. But I agree with the other the previous presenters that what we see in the market. When we have our fundamental analysis, we have things that we can read and see and we can measure and do our calculations. But the psychology is the more difficult part. So we feel around the place, and you speak to your clients, the front line. Uh, reps, speak to clients, ask them questions, feed it back to me. As well as while you're trading, you're, spe you're speaking to brokers. And we do speak among each other, among the professionals. Right. And you get co you correlate around the same reasons. Uh, about December, we noticed that the bids were a little, the buyers seem to have eased off a little. Usually, the market is fairly, is priming to get active in the December period. Why? Because in the first quarter of the calendar year, a lot of results have been published and we expect results to be good. A lot of companies are declaring dividend to, so we expect people to buy cash flow. But the market, the buyers stayed out. As my two presenters uh, previously said, that they were in fact holding back saving cash to come into the new impending IPOs. Billions of dollars were being released or is to be absorbed through these IPOs in the first quarter. And that is the initial reason. But also, I think the news of the coronavirus, how did it, what's the pathway to Jamaica? Over the last week and a half, we noticed that more and more uh, business people uh, are coming into the, 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 the media space, speaking to the coronavirus and the impact it may have on them. And I think this has triggered the psychology of the investing public to pull back further. Okay, all right, very interesting. I mean, I don't know if you'll have this off the top of your head, but it kind of triggered a question. You said that you noticed in December, December quarter, that um, bids generally across the board were lower than previous years. Do you have any estimation of, you know, is it like 10% lower, 20% lower than last year? Or? Okay, well, it's difficult to put a figure on the prices, but you know, we can see the uptrend through the indices on a day-to-day -day basis, and then you see a pullback, you see? But to look at what particular stocks are pulling back, we know that there are some stocks that are heavy. The financial sector makes up about 60% of the indices. And N uh, NCB and Scotia Group, NCB is probably about 3.4 billion shares. Multiply that by $170. Uh, Scotia is about, probably about 2.1 billion. Multiply that by about $50. So that alone, a pullback on any of these stocks can have a big impact on the indices. Yeah. So just one of them in CB alone can pull back the indices. Right. So we have seen things like that. But still, they are one of the more, uh, some of the more li liquid securities. What we have seen though, what I have observed though, you know, you can see the, the quotations, is that usually you say heavy bids, 10, 20, 30,000, you know? And yes, the small investors are there, packed with the 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, and you notice it's thinning out to order for 200 units, order for 1,000 units, order for 5,000 units. You see? So this is what we see, what we call a thinness of right. the bids, or a thinness of the buyers. So not just a pullback in price, but in terms of how many units they are willing to buy. Interesting. And what it means, if they're willing to buy a small and small amount, then someone who's selling 5,000 right. can, can easily wipe out that, those bids and the price significantly fall. Okay, all right, thank you very much. That's very, very interesting. So, and, and then another thing that you know, we saw last week that I want to talk is, a, is First Rock, right? The performance of their, their, their stock. So they listed, and you know, the first day of trading was the 21st of February. Um, the stock price climbed 10%, but over you know, the last week or so, it has been, it's down significantly. So as of Friday, March 6th, it closed at $10 something, right? That's down from 16, 67. 
Any quick thoughts? Well, in relation to First Rock, the first thing is that we'd have to consider it as, it's about context, you'd have to think about it as a long-term investment. So individuals who would have gone into an investment like this for the purpose of flipping, so to speak, mm -hmm. just going in, going out, the IPO, um, the IPO flipping, it would definitely be a misalignment with the core function of First Rock as an investment. So, I mean, it would pose a challenge in, in that area. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. You'd have to do so that. what you're saying is that people that um, misunderstood or misread what the how First Rock should fit in their portfolio right. and how it may perform at IPO, especially if they leave out, meaning they take margin or whatever, <laughs> then you know, chances are that they are probably unwinding those po that position, which for sure drives on the stock price. For sure. Okay. All right. Um, I know we have Julian here from Proven, but uh, I'll go to Eric. You know, so we have we also have the Proven APO. Right. Um, you know, can you just share some information about it? Your thoughts? It's good. It's been offered at a fair price. Um, um, in my opinion, how much are they raising? And they are trying to raise approximately seven billion dollars um, to as capital injection in the company for um, upcoming in deals that are in their pipeline. Um, obviously, to grow the business, um, the price is being offered at a discount relatively. And it has an attractive dividend yield based on the APO's price, which is around four point nine percent durable. With the market pullback, the the stock price is coming closer to where I that APO that. price is right now. So you have to be mindful of that and be careful that as as opposed to buying into the APO or buying the shares on the open market. So right. that can be of a tricky a tricky situation. Okay. But overall, um good good buy. Okay, Clive. Yes, uh, proven is one of the better stocks on the ma on the market. Um, it's a very strong well first and foremost as a trader and as analyst we we'll look at the management composition, you know, the people who lead the company, and the, just the seriousness, just the experience, you know, and wisdom, I said, mm -hmm. in terms of the decisions that are made, that's one. Two, proven as a track record, the prior to proven and subsequent within proven. And over the years, I've done some significant deals, you know. Uh, they, so they made a gain of 21 million US on the disposal of access financials. Uh, they have some shares in Nutsford Capital, I believe. Uh, they have just acquired 20% of JMMB. I was going to say that. Right. <laughs> and interestingly, this, this is a key indicator. When another company buys a piece of you, Barita Investment has bought 5% of, of proven investment. But in terms of proven's valuation, it's cheap. It's one of the cheaper stocks on the market. And you can see it's now building out its brand, not just within Jamaica, but within, throughout the wider Caribbean, and fairly diversified within the financial sector. So I think it provides a good value. The stock price, though, I think investment are really going hold about it, even though it has retreated in line with what has happened with other stocks recently. But since last year, it moved from about $28, $29, in excess of $50. So the market is really going hold about it. The results, the dividend payout, all the deals that are structuring, uh, the, the acquisitions, etc. You see? And the market has reacted to that positively. Uh, and then Julian, so speaking about what you know, Clive just mentioned in terms of it being uh, conservatively valued, especially relative to its peers. You know, I've always wondered how come you know proven trades at a, a much lower value, multiple than on, on many measures, price to book, price to you know earnings generally, relative to its peers. Can you just? I, and I've chalked it up to maybe you know market just doesn't quite understand what proven is and what they do. So can you give us a quick synopsis of? What you know? What is proven? Like, what is their business model? What do they do? Sure. And yeah, thoughts on that. So, proven is actually a strategic investor. Mm -hmm. So, what proven does is to look at investment opportunities that mm -hmm. investors wouldn't normally get access to, and they would take a position in those investments. Mm -hmm. So, essentially, proven is a is a specialized investment manager. Okay. So, for instance, proven took a ten percent stake, I believe, in Not for the Express, then listed it. And that's an example of the type of investments that Proven does. I believe the JMMB deal allowed persons to gain more familiarity with the, with the company. And as a result, you would have seen that price action last year. Right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, gentlemen. Let's take our final break. Taking Stock, The Analysts was brought to you by Proven Wealth, Jamaica Money Market Brokers, and Ideal Portfolio Services. That's our show for this week. Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to this channel and check out Kalila's other features 
Money Mondays JA, Money Moves JA, and What's In It For Me. You can follow her on Instagram and Twitter at Kalila Ray. You can follow me on Twitter at Mark Gale with a C, M A R C. You can also DM me for information on classes so you can learn how to navigate this market volatility easier. On Money Mondays this week, Kalila interviews CEO of Proven Management Limited, Chris Williams, to talk about their additional public offer. Tell a friend about taking stock. As Kalila says, investing is a new sexy, so let's make it cool to talk about money. <laughs>